Good morning. Good morning and good Sunday. I hope that this new day finds you well. My name is Leon Dunkley. I minister to North Universalist Chapel Society in Woodstock, Vermont. I'm coming to you early morning live from Silver Lake opposite the Barnard General Store where the air is clean and only good things happen. I'm so happy that you're tuning in. Today is Sunday, May 17th, uh, and the title of this morning's reflection is I Will Give Up Music, something I never thought I'd say. Um, so to this service and to this good day, I bid you welcome. Uh, to all souls, I say good morning. It's good to be together. Uh, Silver Lake is where it all happens. It's the center of the world if you know what you're looking for, and what you're looking for takes time to find. And since we have a little time, let's do it right. I've been singing this song lately. It's called Me and My Guitar. Always in the same mood. I am mostly flesh and bones and he is mostly wood. <laughs> but he never does grow impatient for the changes I don't know, no. If he can't go to heaven, baby, I don't want to go, no. Picture me in the key of E and call me Uncle John. <laughs> Any fool can easily see that we go back a long time. Feel something like fine to me, and there's no such thing as the wrong time. He hops up on my knee, singing, get down, pops, it's song time. It's a great song. It's a song by James Taylor uh, off of an album called The Walking Man. If you don't already know by now, I access spirit by way of music, by way of playing the guitar. Uh, by playing it poorly most of the time uh, until the time I get it right and oftentimes that time is so much later than I plan. Music is the center of my theology. I practice a lot and sometimes practice can be very boring. So I go in the early morning to the Barnard General Store and I grab a cup of coffee and I watch the sunrise over the lake and I practice whatever I'm practicing over and over and over again. There's no other way for me to improve on my instrument. It takes a lot of time. And while I practice on the porch, miracles always seem to happen. The whole world comes right here for all to see. The obvious melody sounding over the water, the rhythm changing of cars in the parking lot, the exquisite harmony of utterly average conversation all buoyed by six strings and a wooden box. From here at the Barnard General Store, you can learn almost everything there is to know about the world. <laughs> you can learn about the, how the town of Barnard spends its money and why we're taxed the way that we are taxed. You can learn about love and relationships. You can learn about loneliness too, if you listen hard enough. And learning about loneliness is especially important in these days of COVID lockdown. These are strange days, indeed. And from this place, you can even learn about Sufism in India. I know because I tend to spend my mornings on this porch in the summertime when it's warm enough. And I know because I'm reading a book on Sufism and I'd like to do a lot of my reading from right here. From this porch with a decent cup of coffee that you can get right there inside, you can learn about anything at all if you bring the right inner resources that you need, if you know just how and when to give them up. How do you know how to do that? How do you surrender? How do you give up what's precious to you? Really, why would you ever choose to do such a thing? It sounds insane. Now I admit, it's a pretty big question to raise over just one cup of coffee. And I also admit that the first time I heard such a question, I blew it off. I didn't want to think at all about it. It sounded awful until I realized that the answer was actually really cool. So I'm glad we have some time to talk about it. Now I've got a jet. Uh, I've got to get back over to the church and it's 10 miles over the hill. So I've got to get there right away. Uh, I've got to speak there again in like three minutes or so. Um, while I'm driving, let's go ahead and sing the opening hymn together, uh, shall we? Um, and I'll sing with you while I'm traveling. Please rise in body and spirit and join in the singing of the opening hymn for the beauty of the, uh, for, for the beauty of the earth. 
uh, let's sing with grace enough to meet the morning. So that was exciting. <laughs> um, I'm glad I made it here in good time. The traffic was light and the drive was safe. Um, so everything worked out just fine. While I was driving and while I was singing our opening hymn, I was reflecting on the questions that I raised at Silver Lake. How does one surrender the inner resources that one needs? Why decide to do such a crazy thing? Um, so first of all, what are those inner, inner resources? There are many, probably. Uh, I think the first two are fearlessness and hope. Vandana Shiva says, and I quote, good societies have cultivated fearlessness and hope among their citizens. Good politics has always been about real courage and real fearlessness. Every leader worth their name promotes fearlessness and hope." End quote. So those two count for sure, um, but what are some of the other ones? No, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm having difficulty he hearing you through the cloud technology. What was, what was that? Ah, yes, humor. <laughs> uh, I think humor is definitely part of the deal. Um, and, and that reminds me, um, there was this religious education class uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. I watched the children take it when I still lived out there. Uh, the kids were about five or six years old, uh, and one day they came into one of the meetings I was running in order to share what they had learned. They were young along the journey. Uh, they call that bright faith. They were so excited. They knew some things, but they didn't really know what they knew. Not just yet. Uh, so the teacher tested them, and then things got really funny. So uh, the test was on religious iconography, iconography and symbols. Uh, my friend's son, Kevin, was the most enthusiastic of the students. The teacher held up a Christian symbol, and Kevin blurted out, the cross! He blurted out his answer as he was raising his hand to be called upon. Uh, Kevin was a little overconfident, overeager. Then the teacher held up an Islamic symbol, and he blurted out again, the star and the moon, and the, this time he was a little bit less sure of himself. The star and the crescent, the teacher said, making a minor correction. And then she held up the third symbol, a Jewish symbol. And our young religious scholar, true to form, blurted out. This time he raised his hand and blurted out his answer in a less strong, less secure kind of way. Um, he knew that he knew something, but he wasn't sure 
about what he knew. So bravely, he just took his first best guess. He said, the star of Kevin? <laughs> And we all just broke out laughing, including little Kevin himself, or rather uh, his newly self-appointed holiness, who didn't know why we were all cracking up. Uh, cute kid, this little Kevin. Uh, I hope that he still has his chutzpah. I hope that he still sees himself in such a holy way, although maybe not necessarily in such so much in the center of things. It was glorious to see such good light follow, uh, flowing through him. It was glorious to be in his glow. So joy is also an inner resource. I light a candle, not for the star of Kevin, but for the star within us all, uh, and for his infectious spirit in these times of darkness. This is the time in our service for the sharing of joys and concerns. If you have a joy or concern in your heart, I invite you to call it forth at this time and speak it aloud from wherever you find yourself at present. Say the longings of your heart and send its good light over to North Chapel, where we can gather our hearts together in this time of distancing. So let's slow down. Uh, let's take a breath. Let's gather ourselves a bit. Breathing in and breathing out, breathing out and breathing in. I alight six candles this morning. The first one is for the joy of Kevin. The second one is a, a sad joy for Alice, the German shepherd and spirit guide for Laura Foley and Clara Jimenez. And their dog just died uh, days after Clara's successful surgery on May the 4th. Laura prepared these words for me and I'll share them with you. It's hard not to believe she intentionally stayed alive to shepherd her mistress through the long course of chemo treatments, then surgery to cut away the greatest danger. Three days later, Alice left this life, our aged shepherd beast, thickly furred, silky, lithe. How easy she made the leaving seem, her last teaching. Thank you, Laura. We are holding you and your family. The third candle is a candle of joy and sorrow intertwined for Jan and her father, Jack Hutzler. Jack died earlier this week out in Jefferson, Indiana. Uh, Reverend Jan Hutzler, as many of you may know, serves as the Unitarian, as the minister uh, at the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Upper Valley, our sister congregation over in Norwich. Jan is my close colleague and my dear friend, and I hold her tenderly in my heart these days, she and her family. So our third candle is for Jack, a passionate believer in family and a member of the Double H Square Dance Club. We will miss you. So this is also a candle to everyone, uh, everyone in the Norwich congregation, some of whom might be joining us this morning. So welcome, it's good to see you. Uh, the next three candles I light ritualistically. For those who are ill, I light a candle for your quick recovery. For those who suffer economic challenges, I light a candle in the hope that your needs will soon be met. For those who are feeling fearful, anxious, angry, I light a candle for strength, resilience, and courage. Recovery, hope, courage. May these good things light our way for all that has been spoken and for that which remains within the silent sanctuary of our hearts. May we be thankful for these days we spend together. For this, I will light one more candle. May we hold all of this in compassionate community as we enter a time of meditation and prayerfulness.
I don't know about you, but I make a lot of assumptions about life. I'm fairly good at making assumptions. I'm fairly practiced. I do it regularly. Over the years, I have become quite comfortable in making assumptions. The only uncomfortable part, the only downside of making my assumptions is that I am almost always wrong. <laughs> now, with assumptions, it's better to be entirely wrong than it is to be in the ballpark. And a lot of times I'm in the ballpark and it doesn't really work for me. When, when I'm sort of right in my assumptions, my ego takes over and I start to hold on to things. My thoughts conform to the needs of my self-esteem and less to, to reality. And I'm trapped inside this ego-based set of thoughts. And when I'm there, I can't be in the here and the now. So it's better when I'm totally wrong, so I can abandon my assumptions entirely. Rarely do they serve me very well. And if, if you're like me, it might be better for you to do the same. I don't know. You'll have to tell me how that works out for you. I used to have a lot of assumptions about music. Uh, when I was in my 20s, I wanted to know all about the world, so I figured the best way to find out about it was to travel. So I drove across the country several times. I was really into it. Uh, I liked connecting with the people. I remember thinking that I could make a life of this. At that point, I was interested in music, people, travel, and God. So I figured I'd become an ethnomusicologist. An ethnomusicologist is a scholar who studies music and culture all around the world. So I had everything covered. So it was decided I was now, that was gonna be my first career. So I went out looking for my teacher and I was passionate about it. Very soon I found one. His name was Mantle Hood. He was my guy. We got along fabulously, uh, famously, like nobody's business. He was always teaching with a smile. We disagreed only once in our time together and everything else was bliss. He taught me how to surrender, how to give up my assumptions about good music. That might have been his best lesson to me. Now, he had studied gamelan, which is a musical tradition in Indonesia, in Java and in Bali specifically. He, studying with mantle hood meant learning how to play that instrument, learning how to play in that tradition. It meant participating in the gamelan uh, performance ensemble. Uh, the word gamelan means orchestra, Okay, so the gamelan refers to many different instruments. There was a whole room full of instruments and all the graduate students took part. We all, we all played. Uh, we got really good. Um, when I began though, I did not remotely understand the music. When I first encountered it, I knew nothing about it. It sounded strange to me. Like the clanging sounds, the shimmering sounds, the gongs you could feel in your bones, and the sound of the the, the fragile suling, the end-blown flute with its gentleness and grace. The music that we played was written out in numbers. It was really hard to read. It looked like a weird kind of telephone book to me. I, I was flailing, and I was failing trying to read this music in real time. Now, generally, I have a great deal of trouble reading written words and music. My mind switches things sometimes. I'm a slow learner in that way. So I was almost totally adrift with this gamelan rehearsal. And I thought to myself, you know, no one's gonna notice. I thought that no one would know that I didn't know how to do what I was trying to pretend that I could do. That was my first assumption, that people couldn't see through my pretenses. And I also thought that the music was new to everyone. Of course it wasn't, but before I realized this, I thought several things to myself. I thought, you know, with this music, there's no obvious melody. The chord structures are imperceivable to me. There's no appreciable harmony. So who's going to notice if I don't play it exactly right? I tried to give myself a break. So at that first re rehearsal, I just played along. I, I faked it. I faked what I was doing, and I thought I got away with it. Uh, the rehearsal lasted uh, a little bit more than an hour on that first day. Our job as students was to familiarize ourselves with the basic playing technique. That only took a few minutes, but the class dragged on for a while. I became impatient. The length of the class was uncomfortable to me. 
I was glad when it was over. I didn't really enjoy that one very much. In fact, I wondered if I had chosen the right teacher. Maybe I was wrong. Mandel Hood seemed like an ancient, half-crazy man to me, and I usually appreciate that in a person. <laughs> uh, but not just then. Plus, I'd lost respect for him a little tiny bit because I'd, I'd faked my way through, and this great sage didn't even notice. I was inwardly discouraged, but I tried not to let it show. Then Mandel Hood approached me directly. As I was getting ready to go home, he came up to me, calm and dispassionate, and he said, you have a good tone on your instrument and your rhythmic feel is very good, but you know, you can't hear a melody to save your life. And then he turned away. I was busted and I had been all along. I wanted to get him back somehow. I wanted to throw something at him or something, but he was already too far away. I could tell, though, by the shape of the back of his head that he was smiling as he walked. I, I could tell by the bounce of his gait that he knew that he had gotten me. God, he was a great teacher. Uh, he died in 2005. I think he was like 117 years old and young. I will never forget him. He taught me so much. He was a true citizen of the world and a genuine friend of spirit. A poet writes, I met a friend of spirit and he drank and he womanized. And I sat before his sanity. I was holding back from crying. And he saw my complications and he mirrored me back, simplified. And we laughed how our perfections would always be denied. Heart and humor, he said, and humility. This will lighten up your heavy load. Now I know it's not true, but when Joni Mitchell wrote those words, it was like she was writing them for my teacher. The one who in the best possible way destroyed my assumptions about good music. Now, I studied with Mantle Hood for three years, but I'm sure he would have understood uh, my title, I Will Give Up Music, especially as I put it in quotations. He wouldn't have been worried about that title. You see, for many years, I have been moved by the teachings of a Sufi artist named Hazrat Inyad Khan. He lived between 1882 and 1927. He was born in India. He was born into a renowned musical family and he met great musicians and scholars from his childhood and throughout his life. Music was his touchstone and the instrument that he played was called the Veena. The Veena is a stringed instrument, not unlike the sitar or the sarod, if you're familiar with those instruments. The tradition of Veena playing is, in, is one of incredible precision and creative subtlety. If you're open to it, the Vena can give you so very much in terms of musical experience. For Hazrat Inyat Khan, the Vena was his instrument of choice and side by side with his love of music, he had an ardent interest in the inner life. He was an avid reader of sacred texts of many traditions. Inyat Khan's universal spirit embraced all creeds, all faiths, all beliefs. In this sense, he was like us. He was a universalist, small you. He studied Sufism most uh, directly, most deeply, and he became one of the spiritual, one of the great spiritual luminaries of his age. Now I'm learning about him from this book called uh, Mysticism, The Mysticism of Sound and Music. In this book, he tells a short story of introduction, the story that is central to this morning's reflection. So here it is. He writes, I gave up music because I had received from it all I had to receive, to serve God. One must sacrifice the dearest things, and I sacrificed my music, the dearest thing to me. He writes, I had composed songs and I sang and played the vena. Practicing this music, I arrived at a stage where I touched the music of the spheres. Then every soul became a musical note for me. All of life became music. Inspired by it, I spoke to the people and those who were attracted to my words listened to them instead of listening to my songs. I played vena until my heart turned into that instrument. Then I offered this instrument to the divine musician, 
the only musician existing. Since then, I have become his flute, and when he chooses, he plays his music. The people give me credit for this music, which in reality is not due to me, but due to the musician who plays his own instrument. It's beautiful. He played until his heart turned into song, which is beautiful and useful because we need so much beauty now because the challenge before us is so great. John Lennon wrote, nobody told me there'd be days like these, but he really wasn't thinking about what we're living through right now. How do you pray in dangerous days like these? I think that how we pray, pray changes a whole lot over time. And how is prayer meaningful to you? In a poem called The Summer Day, Mary Oliver raises what I consider to be some theological questions. She asks, who made the world and its lovely creatures? Why are grasshoppers so fascinating? And she makes a confession of a kind. She admits to us, I don't know what prayer is. And, and when she says it, I don't believe her. And I don't believe her because right after she says it, she says, I don't know what prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. What is this if not a prayer? She asks, tell me at the end of this poem, tell me what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? So we do know some things and we don't know some things, but one thing is for sure. We know that life is precious. We know that life is precious and wild. We may forget this sometimes, but it comes back to us when we need to remember. It comes back to us in music, as in the music of Dana Kurtz, who reminds us in song, when I dance, when we dance, she writes, that's when I remember all the ways you can spin me around and it's not your skill or your style or your gaze, or your smile. It's how you hold me. It's how you're holding me now. You hold me strong and tender, like it would hurt you to let me fall down, like I'm precious and wild. Like I'm a newborn child, it's how you hold me. It's how you're holding me now. We know that life is precious. We know that life is precious and wild. We know that we get just this one life to live. So what is it? What are the inner resources that we need to make this life spectacular? When our spirits outstretch our bodies and we lay our bodies down in the end, what resources will have been useful to us to have made that good life beautiful? I will give up music. We all will lay it down when it's our time. But in these days, these days that we spend together, what will be our poem? What will be our rhyme? What shall be the sound of our brave instrument? Now, I'm reminded, of course, of the peace prayer of St. Francis. Francis of Assisi, the Italian Catholic friar, deacon, preacher, who prays, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. This prayer was his song. And life was his great instrument. Like so many beautiful spiritual teachers in our world, in and among us. Joy is our inheritance. It's one of the inner resources that we need. Fearlessness, hope, joy, heart, humor humility, grace. I used to think that praying wasn't cool when I was in my 20s, that it was some form of helplessness, a submission, an admission of vulnerability, back when I had a lot of assumptions about how life is, assumptions that did not lead my spirit to where my spirit needed to go. So over time, I learned to surrender them, I learned to give them up. Giving up on music, 
No, I'm not sure. That one's going to take me a while. Until I do, I want to keep practicing in the warm and early morning hours down by the Barnard General Store across from Silver Lake. You know, I hear they have a decent cup of coffee. May our prayers, may our music, may our hearts reach one another in this time, in these crisis, in these crisis days, in these challenging, difficult days. May we learn how to sing the beautiful song that is our life and enjoy the music that we make. May it be so, blessed be, and amen. Breathe softly, breathe softly, breathe softly.